Late night stargazing now on BBC One with Patrick Moore. Good evening. In this programme, we're going to look at the language of astronomy. Do you understand right ascension and declination? What is an orrery? Will a meteor land in your garden? All will become clear. But first of all, a couple of news notes. We have a comet, Comet Linear, photographed here by John Randall. Not a very bright one, not far from the Great Bear, just about our naked eye visibility, easily seen by binocular, but it certainly won't rival Halo of a few years ago. But it is the brightest comet for some time. And there's this track across the sky. So look for it. It'll be brightest round about July 25. And then we've heard a lot about water on Mars. Can there be liquid water on the red planet? Well, I think, frankly, no. There's a picture of Mars. Here's a close-up of a Martian crater. And those gullies there seem to have been cut by running water. But you can't have running water there now. The air pressure is too low. But there may be liquid water not far below the surface. We must wait and see. And now, on to our main theme. Over the past 43 years, we've used many astronomical terms. Some are easier to understand, others may be unfamiliar. So we thought we'd now go back to square one and give you a rundown of some of those terms we're always using. And with me, Chris Lintot of Morgan College, Cambridge. Welcome to the sky at night, Chris. Thank you. Begin, I think, with my favorite subject, the solar system, dominated by the sun. And the sun is a perfectly ordinary star, so big you could throw a million Earths inside it, a huge globe of gas. And around it go the planets. The sun, after all, is a star, a perfectly ordinary star, and appears so much brighter than the others because it's so <coughs> close to us, only 93 million miles away. And that is not much for an astronomer. And all those luminous specks you see at night are themselves suns, many of them larger, hotter, and more powerful than ours. And around the sun go the planets, which have no light of their own, and shine only by being lit up by the sun. First of all, the inner ones, Mercury, Venus, Earth and Mars. Then a gap, then the big ones, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune, and finally, little Pluto on the edge. And between the paths of Mars and Jupiter evolve many small worlds known as minor planets or asteroids. Here's a close-up picture of one, Cleopatra, shaped rather like a dog's bone. Also, there are comets. Comets are the most erratic members of the system. They're really dirty ice balls, and when they come into the sun, they start to evaporate, and they produce heads and tails. And there is comet hale Bop, a bright one seen some years ago. I took that picture myself. And there are the, the curved dust tail and the straight gas tail. That will be back in several thousand years. Most comets go around the sky and the sun in long, narrow paths, not circles, and most of them go out a long way. There's a typical comet orbit, because hale Bob goes out much further than that. As a comet moves along, it leaves a dusty trail behind it. Then one of these small particles dashes into the upper air, is heated by friction, and burns away in the creep we call a meteor or shooting star. And there's a picture of some, but I may say they look much more like this, as this picture here is shown here by Dr. John Mason. And that's all a shooting star is, a tiny particle burning away in the Earth's upper air and burning out at a height of 40 miles above the ground. A larger particle may reach the entire surface without being destroyed, then called a meteorite. And here's a piece of a small meteorite, but they can be large occasionally. They may even make craters. And here's a picture of meteorite crater in Arizona, nearly a mile wide, made by an impact about 50,000 years ago. And there's a theory, only a theory, that about 65 million years ago, we were hit by a body and caused a change in climate and wiped out the dinosaurs. That, I mean, that is only a theory. Now, some planets have secondary bodies or satellites going around them. Uranus has 20. We have one, our familiar moon, again shining only by reflecting the light of the sun, and close to us, only 239,000 miles away, and going around the Earth once in 27.3 days, our faithful companion as we journey around the sun. We finished our lightning tour of the solar system with my own favourite subject, the moon. Now, Chris, what about that familiar term, 
year. Yes, although astronomers might call this the sidereal period of the Earth. It's simply the time taken for the Earth to go around the Sun, and it's three, six, five and a quarter days. Other planets go around the Sun too, at different distances and in different times. Mercury shoots round in 88 days, but Pluto takes a leisurely 248 years to complete an orbit. Now, I said they're at different distances. Earth's at a very cosy distance of 93 million miles, or about 150 million kilometers, if you prefer metric. And we call this the astronomical unit, and we use it to measure other distances. So using this astronomical unit, or AU, you see that Mercury is 0.39 AU from the Sun, whereas Pluto uh, is 40 times as far away as we are. Of course, in astronomy, there are so many scales of distance. We have uh, various units. I, mean, I can say that the moon is 0 0.003 astronomical units from us, but it's much easier to say 239,000 miles. And there's another point too. I said just now, the moon goes around the Earth. That's not strictly true. No, not strictly. Um, any two bodies orbiting each other go around their common centre of mass. So, for example, if um, the two bodies are of equal mass, the centre of mass lies between, exactly between them and they orbit that. In the case of the Earth and the moon, the centre of mass is called the barycentre and lies inside the Earth, but not quite at the centre, so the Earth can be said to orbit it. Um, now, another interesting effect you, with the Earth-Moon system, what everyone knows, the phases. Uh, if you imagine the Sun coming up from the bottom of the screen now, um, you see uh, it lights half the Moon, but the dark side is turned towards us, which is what we see as a new Moon. Yes. As the Moon goes round us, the proportion of the light side turned towards us changes, and we go from our new Moon to a waxing crescent to first quarter, when we see half the moon illuminated, round to waxing gibbous, and then finally a full moon, when the whole bright side is turned towards us. Then back through a waning gibbous phase, third quarter, waning crescent, and back round to another new moon a month later. Another effect seen with the moon as a crescent is Earth's shine, when the dark side appears to be lit up. Simply sunlight reflecting off the Earth's atmosphere, hitting the dark side and coming back down to us as an observer on Earth. In this picture, the um, crescent you see is an overexposed picture of the light side, and what you're looking at is actually the dark side being lit up. You see that very often. Of course, it's not the end of the moon that shows phases. Some of the planets do, too. Yes, that's right, particularly those closer to, closer to the sun than we are. For example, if we look at this 18th century orrery here, with the sun in the centre, Mercury, Venus, Earth and the moon, you'll see that as they go round, they form, di they form different angles with the Earth and sun and turn different proportions of their light side to us, uh, and so we see phases. Um, Let's, focus, let's concentrate on Venus. When it's between the Earth and the Sun, the dark sides turn towards us and we see a new Venus and it moves round um, through the crescent phase, through the, the half phase and round it till we see a new, we would see a full Venus. Of course that's when Venus is on the other side of the Sun, so we can never actually observe that. And then back round to another crescent. When Mercury or Venus is in this position, between the Sun and the Earth, it's said to be at inferior conjunction. And normally, of course, you can't see it. But if the lining up's exact, then we see the planet silhouetted against the sun as a black disk, and that's called a transit. And there's a picture of a transit of Mercury. But because the paths of the planets are tilted, transits don't happen very often. The last transit of Mercury was in 1999. The last transit of Venus, way back in 1882. And the next one went to the year 2004. Now, planets further away from the Sun than we are behave rather differently. Here's a picture I drew of Mars some time ago. It does show a slight phase, as you can see. But, of course, these planets can't appear as crescents. That's right. They don't come between us and the Sun. However, this graphic does show how Mars's phase does change. Once we get out to Jupiter and beyond, though, the Sun shines pretty much fully on the face presented to us, and we don't see any phase at all. Obviously, a planet further away from the Sun than we are can't reach inferior conjunction, can't come between the Sun and ourselves, but all planets can come to superior conjunction. You see here, with the Earth, the Sun and Mars, Mars on the far side of the Sun. And then, this all-important thing of opposition. All planets beyond the Earth's orbit can come to opposition. This time the Sun, Earth and planet are lined up with the Earth in the mid-position. The Sun and the planet are then on opposite sides of the sky. The planet's best place for observation and is above the horizon all through the hours of darkness. Let's have a look at what happens to Mars. Here we have the situation in April 1999, Mars at opposition, opposite the Sun and the sky. A year later, Earth had been right round the Sun and come back to the same position in its orbit. But Mars travels more slowly, has further to go. Mars takes 687 Earth days to go round the Sun and more than 141 million miles out. Therefore, Earth has to catch it up, so to speak, 
and doesn't do so until the June 2001 when there is another opposition. So oppositions on Mars don't occur every year. There's another point too. Round about the time of opposition, Mars appears to describe a slow loop in the sky called retrograding. Of course, it's really moving steadily, but in this computer simulation, you can see what happens. We are now plotting the apparent path of Mars against a stationary star background with that long, slow loop. Now, what about Jupiter? Much further from the Sun, nearly 500 million miles, taking nearly 12 years to go round. Again, we have the same kind of thing. Jupiter, a vast world, far bigger than the Earth, very bright in the sky. And this time, Earth takes much less time to catch it up. An opposition, therefore, in October 1999, and another in November 2000. And therefore, Jupiter comes to opposition every year. The interval between one opposition and the next is known as the synodic period. As you can see from this table, the synodic periods of the planets differ. Also, important to remember, Chris, that the power of the planets are not circles, they are ellipses. That's right. Uh, Earth is at its closest, it's 91 and a half million miles from the Sun, and at its furthest, 94 and a half million miles. When it's at its closest, we say a planet is at perihelion. When it's at its furthest, we say it's aphelion. And those terms hold for any body going around the Sun. If it's the going around the Earth, like the Moon, we use similar terms, apogee and perigee. Curiously, however, our British winter occurs when we're closest to the Sun at perihelion. Uh, and the reason for the seasons isn't therefore the distance, it's the tilt of the Earth's axis. Um, it's inclined to our movement around the Sun by 23.4 degrees, which is known as either the axial tilt or the axial inclination. This is the reason for the seasons. If you imagine standing at the North Pole, looking along it, in January you'd be looking away from the Sun, so the Northern Hemisphere receives less heat and light, and so we have winter. In June you'd be looking towards the Sun, get more heat and light, and so we have summer. South Pole, of course, if you look along that, um, the positions are reversed. In June you're looking away from the Sun and have winter, and in January, you're looking towards the sun, and you have summer, which is why Australians can enjoy their Christmas dinner on the beach. Certainly, but conditions on other planets aren't the same. No, because their tilts are, tilts are different, which I can show using this. If you imagine this odd thing is a planet, Mars has a similar tilt to our own, about 24 degrees. Mercury has no tilt at all. Venus is very odd. It appears to go backwards, so we say it has a rotation of about a, a tilt of 180 degrees, like so. And Uranus is right over its side at 98 degrees. Um, what caused these last two planets to be quite so odd? No one knows, but many theories have been proposed. They have indeed. Now, let's go much further afield now to the stars. Bearing in mind the stars are suns, and they're so far away, their individual or proper motions are so slight you can't notice them over many centuries. We all know the phenomena of rising and setting. A body rises eastward, crosses the sky, and sets westward, and here we see the setting sun. Due entirely to the rotation of the Earth. Take a time exposure of the stars, and the Earth's rotation means they'll be drawn out into trails, as we see here. So it happens that northward, the Earth's axis points to the north celestial pole, marked closely by a bright star called Polaris. Therefore, as the Earth spins, Polaris appears to remain almost still, with everything else going round it. And there we see star trails, Polaris over there to the left-hand side, and the further away from the pole, the longer the trail. Obviously, in the sky, we need to know where we're looking. We want a system of coordinates. And that leads us to those we have on the Earth's surface. Let's come back to the Earth for a minute. We have two, latitude and longitude. Latitude is your angular distance north or south of the Earth's equator. Where I live in Celsius, I'm at latitude 52 degrees north. Longitude, distance either east or west of the Greenwich Meridian, a great circle passing through both poles and through Greenwich Observatory. Now that we can fix our position on the Earth's surface. We want the same kind of thing in the sky. So let's imagine now the celestial sphere, an imaginary sphere whose center is the same at the center of the Earth. The celestial equator is merely the projection of the Earth's equator onto the celestial sphere. So just as the Earth's equator divides our world into two hemispheres, so the celestial equator is that the same for the sky, and there also we see at the North Celestial Pole. We need, therefore, the sky equivalent of latitude and longitude. Take latitude first. Look at the bright star Betelgeuse and Orion. That is 7 degrees, 25 minutes, north of the excelsior equator. Therefore, we say the declination of Betelgeuse is 7 degrees, 25 minutes. So that is the equivalent of the sky of latitude. We call it declination, but 
loyalty is more of a problem. That's right, and the problem is we have to find a celestial Greenwich, a zero point we can use, but luckily there is one. Now, we go right round the sun once a year, and so the sun appears to go right round the sky once a year, passing through the constellations of the zodiac, and its apparent path as it does this is the ecliptic, the red line on the screen now. Um, it crosses the equator, the green line, twice a year, once in the March equinox, moving from south to north, um, then it reaches its highest point, which is known as a solstice, marking midsummer in this case. There's also one marking midwinter. And then it moves south, and in September crosses the equator again, moving from north to south. The March equinox used to be in the constellation of Aries, and so we call that point the first point of Aries, and this is our celestial Greenwich. Um, the distance east or west of, of a body from that from the first point of Aries is its right ascension, or RA, which is the equivalent of longitude we've been looking for. Um, there's one other thing. We measure RA in a different way to longitude. Um, the first point of Aries rises, reaches its highest point, its culmination, and then sets. Now, it culminates once every 24 hours. So the right ascension of anything else is simply the time difference between the first point of Aries culminating and the body you're looking at culminating. So take Betelgeuse, for example. It culminates five hours and 55 minutes after the first point of Aries does. And so its right ascension is just five hours and 55 minutes. The um, positions of the stars don't change much. So we consider their coordinates to be fixed over any reasonable span of time. But the planets, sun and moon, of course, all move. And so their coordinates are co constantly changing. And there's one more point, too. The first point of Aries is no longer in Aries. It's shifted into the next door constellation of Pisces, the fishes. That's right, and the explanation comes from looking at something like this gyroscope. As you watch it moving, you'll see that the top appears to wobble or process in a small circle. Um, the Earth does exactly the same. Of course, the period's longer. It takes 25,800 years for the Earth just to complete one circle. But the wobble is there, and it moves the first point of Aries by about 50 seconds of arc every year. There's another effect here as well. We're used to Polaris, the pole star, representing the location of the north celestial pole to within half a degree. But precession causes the pole to wander, um, describing a circle which takes in other stars that can become the pole star. For example, um, when the Egyptians were building their pyramids, the um, pole star was Thuban in Alpha Draconis in the constellation of the dragon. And in 12,000 years' time, any sky at night viewers still watching can look forward to the stars rotating about the brilliant star Vega in the constellation of Lyra. But for now, returning to the present day, London is at latitude 52 degrees above the equator, which means that Polaris appears at a height of 52 degrees above the horizon. That means that any star with a declination of above 38 degrees north um, will never set, and we call these stars circumpolar. Of course, it depends where you are on the Earth. From the north or south pole, all the stars are circumpolar. Uh, some never rise, and the ones that are there never set. Meanwhile, on the equator, the north and south poles lie on the opposite ends of the horizon, and the entire sky revolves around you. <laughs> you know, a little while ago, I was in Singapore, within two degrees of the equator, and I saw the, um, uh, the Great Bear in one hemisphere and the Southern Cross on the other. Well, you've got to be at the equator for that. Chris, thank you very much. We'll come back next month and deal with the terms dealing more with the distant sky, nebulae, galaxies, black holes, and so on. So until then, thank you very much. No problem. Don't forget to now newsletter time. If you want your newsletter, send your stamped addressed envelope to newsletter number 78, The Sky at Night, BBC TV, London, W127TS. Or, of course, our website, www.bbc.co.uk slash sky at night, or CFAX page 620. And uh, next month, more definitions. So until then, good night.